Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for September 2024. I'm Hayley and this month we have Saturn at opposition. We have a partial eclipse of the moon. Our constellation of the month is Andromeda and we'll also take a look at the Andromeda galaxy. Let's begin by taking a look at the planets. You can see that I'm looking towards the southeast on the 1st of September, the morning of the 1st of September. And we've got Saturn, Jupiter and Mars all visible. And if I zoom in a little bit on Taurus, we've also got Uranus visible as well. So this area around Taurus is a really interesting part of the sky to explore this month. Taurus is an interesting constellation anyway especially because it contains the Pleiades Seven Sisters star cluster, which you can easily spot with your naked eye, um, even in a light polluted location, and looks really great in binoculars. And as we've discussed before when talking about Uranus, it, with your naked eye, you're not really going to be able to pick it out of the background stars. It's really faint. It doesn't look distinctive at all. But if you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, then you might be able to make out that it has a greenish disc to it. And you can see here that you should just be able to fit it into a binocular view along with the Seven Sisters. Um, so that will make a nice binocular target. See if you can get those two together. Jupiter and Mars rising at around 11 o'clock at the beginning of the month. So if we just go back to 11 o'clock, you can see those just popping out, 11, 12 o'clock. Um, and as the month goes on, they rise earlier. So these two both improve as the month um, goes on. You can see uh, that Mars also is separating from Jupiter and moving into Gemini. Just going to go back to the morning of the 1st and take a look at Mercury. So we've, we've had a look at Jupiter and Mars. We've got Saturn over here, which we're going to talk about more in a minute. Uranus over here by the Pleiades and Mercury is in a good position to observe at the beginning of this month. And Mercury can be quite elusive because it's never very far away from the sun and it can get lost in the morning or the evening twilight. If we just move time onwards towards dawn, you can see that on the 1st we've got Mercury and the moon popping up just before dawn, around 5 o'clock, and... This will be a nice pairing to try and spot a very, very thin crescent moon, which can be quite tricky to spot, and the planet Mercury. So you can have a go at sweeping around with your binoculars to see if you can spot these two. Just be careful that you don't continue to do that once the sun is coming up because you don't want to accidentally damage your eyes. And Mercury actually reaches its point of greatest western elongation on the 5th. And what that means is it reaches its largest separation from the sun, which is usually a good time to try and find it. And then after the 5th, Mercury starts to get lower and close to the sun and not as easy to observe. So if you want to try and catch Mercury this month, I would recommend doing so during the first few days of the month up to the 5th. Um, would be your best opportunity to spot it. Venus is not well placed for observing this month. It gets a bit lost in the evening twilight. It does improve as the month goes on, but even at the end of September, it's still not in a great position for observing. If we take a look at how the moon interacts with the planets this month, we've already had a look at the crescent moon, very thin crescent moon and Mercury on the 1st. If we go to this morning of the 17th, then we can see that the moon, very almost full moon, the moon is full on the 18th this month, and Saturn over here in Aquarius. And then if we continue onwards, we can see that it's moving over to this collection of interesting things um, in Taurus. So if we go to the 22nd, then you've got the moon, the Pleiades and Uranus all forming a triangle over here. So you can have a go at that with your binoculars or a small telescope you'll find that the light from the moon, there'll be lots of light coming from this gibbous moon, will wash out some of the light from um, the Pleiades and from Uranus, but still something that's worth having a go at and see if you can spot those three together. And then if we continue to, through to the 24th, we've got the moon in Jupiter, um, or the 23rd, 24th moon in Jupiter, and then continuing to pass Mars around the 25th, and the 26th. Let's take a closer look at Saturn now. 
Saturn reaches opposition this month, so that means that it's in its best position for viewing from the Earth. Opposition itself occurs on the 8th of September, but you can observe any time during this month and Saturn will be a really good target. If you have a small telescope, you can take a look at Saturn's rings. You can have a look for its large moon Titan. You might even manage Titan with a pair of binoculars. If your binoculars are big enough and you have a tripod or a steady hand, then you might be able to find them with binoculars, but it should certainly be easy with a small telescope. You can see that Saturn's rings appear very thin at the moment because they are tilted with respect to us at only 3.7 degrees and that tilt of Saturn's rings changes over time so sometimes we see them looking quite thin and sometimes we see them looking quite wide and a bit more spectacular. Something that you may notice about the rings if you observe Saturn over the few days approaching opposition, through opposition and then the days following you might notice the Seeliger effect or otherwise known as the opposition surge. Um, so if you observe the rings over that run-up to opposition, you might see that they flare in brightness, um, which is something that can happen around opposition. Normally, the rings appear to be a similar brightness to the disk of the planet, um, and for a short time around opposition, they can suddenly appear to be brighter than the disk of the planet. So that's something to look out for if you are in a position to observe Saturn over the course of a few nights. The effect, um, the opposition, opposition effect is named after Hugo von Seeliger, and he's the astronomer who first noticed it in 1887. And noticing that effect helped astronomers to understand that the rings are actually made up of lots of small particles. Um, so it was a really important, it led to a really important discovery about the nature of the rings around Saturn. Uh, you can also pay some attention to the movements of Titan. Um, so we said that you should easily be able to find Titan with a small telescope. Uh, and it makes some close approaches to um, Saturn's poles this month. Um, so if we have a look on the second, um, at around 2.50 in the morning, you can see that Titan makes a really close approach to Saturn's south pole. And if we have a look on the 25th, at around 11.20, 11, 20, you can see that it makes a close approach to Saturn's North Pole. Um, so there's lots to do around Saturn this month. You can have a look for the opposition surge um, of brightness in the rings. You can track the movements of Titan and watch it sweeping close to Saturn's poles. If you don't have a telescope or a pair of binoculars, then you can just enjoy the, the sight of Saturn looking really bright and a little bit higher than it has been um, over the course of the last few months. Let's move on to the moon now. This month's full moon is also known as the harvest moon because it's the full moon that occurs closest to the autumn equinox and that occurs on the 18th of September. And it's a special one because it coincides with a partial lunar eclipse. So that is our moon watch target for this month, is to see if you can observe the partial lunar eclipse on the 18th. It begins at approximately 1.41 in the morning. And the thing to do is to go out around half past one and um, or a little bit before half past one and get your eyes nicely dark adapted. So wait for about 20 minutes. Don't look at any other sources of light. Get, make sure you're nicely dark adapted and then just watch the moon and see if you notice that it's starting to darken. And the darkening effect that happens at the beginning of the partial eclipse is really, really subtle. So the challenge is to see if you can notice it. Um, and a partial lunar eclipse occurs when part of the moon is covered by the Earth's shadow. And this subtle darkening that happens at the beginning of the eclipse is when the moon starts to move into the outer part of the Earth's shadow, which is known as the penumbral shadow. And it's quite weak um, shadow, so the effect is quite subtle. So if I start taking us through time, you can see up here just the moon is just looking a slightly darker and if you watch you can see that shadow progressing going this in this direction um, across the moon 
and over the course of those um, minutes following uh, the, the beginning of the eclipse at 1.41, the whole of the moon will move into the penumbral shadow and will look slightly darker than it did before. Then at around 12 minutes past three, the moon will start to move into the umbral shadow, which is the darker part of the Earth's shadow, and it's a much more pronounced effect. And you can see up here that's starting to happen. And in the case of this eclipse, only a little bit of the moon moves into the umbral shadow. So you see a little bite gets taken out of the moon, and then the shadow moves off. And then it begins to move out of the penumbral shadow as well, back to its usual brightness at the end of the eclipse. So your challenge for the lunar eclipse is to see if you can notice both parts of the eclipse um, when you go out to observe. Moving on to our constellation of the month for this month. I'm just going to go into a darker part of the night for this. So continuing with the Perseus family of constellations. So last month, uh, constellation of the month was Perseus to coincide with the Perseids meteor shower. So I want to hop over here and have the constellation of the month this month be Andromeda. And if I put the constellation art on, you can see Perseus depicted as the hero holding the head of Medusa over here. And you can see the princess Andromeda over here. Um, and in Greek mythology, Andromeda is the beautiful princess who was sacrificed to the sea monster Cetus by her parents, King Cepheus and Queen Cassiopeia. And they tied her to a rock in the hope that the sacrifice of her would appease the sea monster and stop it from attacking their shores. And the hero Perseus was flying by and offered to slay the monster in exchange for Andromeda's hand in marriage. And you can see the characters of this story um, depicted in the sky over here. So we've got Cassio Cassiopeia over here, Cepheus over here, Andromeda, Perseus, and we've got Cetus the sea monster down here. The most notable thing in the Andromeda constellation is the Andromeda galaxy. And the way to find the Andromeda galaxy uh, and the constellation as well is to locate the W shape of Cassiopeia, which is a fairly distinctive uh, shape in the night sky. And you, you can also see that over here we've got the um, very familiar constellations of Orion, Taurus, and then over here we've got Cassiopeia. And then if you, the most pointy bit of the W, if you use that as a pointer to point down towards Andromeda, and you can see this little smudge over here is the Andromeda galaxy. And it's the closest major galaxy to us. And at over 2 million light years away from us, it's the furthest object that is visible to the naked eye. So if you can find a dark, you need good, reasonably good eyesight and a dark location. And the dark location is quite key for this because it's quite faint. Um, you should be able to spot it with your naked eye and it will look like a little smudge in the sky and you will be seeing something as it was two million years ago since that light has taken two million years to reach us. If you've got a small telescope or a pair of binoculars, you can try having a look um, and you'll see a slightly bigger a slightly brighter fuzzy patch um, in your in your telescope or your pair of binoculars. And the other thing you can try and do is have a go at photographing it. It's a very popular uh, photography target and the, there are lots of guides online uh, um, to, to tell you about how best to uh, photograph the Andromeda galaxy. But it's, it's a good target if you've never done any deep sky photography before. Let's finish with an ISS pass in case you fancy seeing if you can spot the International Space Station going over this month. I've chosen a pass that is at a quite a sociable time because sometimes we don't want to stay up really late or get up really early to see these things. So this one is uh, at about 12 minutes past nine on the 17th of um, September and you can see it already over here. Um, and as always, if you look towards the west, 
and then you'll be able to watch it going over west to east over the course of five or six minutes and you, if you want to find out about other ISS passes this month then you can always visit the spot the station website and input your location and it will tell you when all the passes are. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for September and I wish you clear skies for all of your observing this month.